Okay, so in the Shire, the hobbits have their own little legends about the creatures in the Shire, and they have these things that are called bogies, which are little, tiny, mischievous creatures. And in the 1960s in America, the Harvard Lampoon wrote a poem, or uh, wrote a story um, based on Lord of the Rings that they called Board of the Rings. And they called the hobbits bogies. So the bogies actually are a real creature from the Shire. So here's a little poem that I'll start it off with to give you a little idea of what the bogies are like. We bogies are a tiny folk. We like to eat until we choke. We love all life, friend and brother, although sometimes we eat each other. We like to break in hobbit holes. We'll eat the food. We'll eat the bowls. We'll eat the pictures on the walls. We'll eat the rugs laid down in halls. We'll eat the soot from the hearth mat. We'll even eat a hobbit's cat. So hobbits, lock your doors so tight, or we will come to you at night and rid you of your very house and leave you poor as any mouse. So, the story you're going to get is called Myrtle's Friends. Myrtle is a hobbit in the Shire. Did you see Ballow Fallenburn's hair? asked the old hobbit codger Toby Bundleweed of his brother Jolly. No, so do tell, what is there to see? asked the equally old and infinitely more nosy Jolly as he perked up for a bit of gossip. His hair has gone stark white, as white as winter snow. Go on, would you? And him, such a young fellow, how could that be? Aye, it was his mother-in-law, Myrtle. Jolly laughed. Herself is the most gentle and good-natured hobbit in all of Waymead. What could that kind hobbit do to turn a lad's hair snow white? It wasn't her, so I hear, but her friends, said Toby with a wink. Jolly shook his head in disbelief. Who, he asked, one of those hobbits that compete with her in the baking contest? Nah, don't be daft. Well, what? Was it one of the old scribblers that works genealogy with her? Nah, don't you say that. I'm one of those scribblers, laughed Toby. Jolly couldn't think of anyone that the old gentle hobbit Myrtle would know that could put such a fright into her good-for-nothing son-in-law. He shrugged his shoulders and gave up guessing. Who, then? Her gambling friends. Ah, uh, go on, gambling friends? Myrtle? It's so. Or at least that's what her daughter is saying. It's a juicy tale if you are in the mood. Toby looked sidelong at his brother to see if he would want to listen. But if you aren't, well, 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 you have me hooked now, Toby. Go on, I'm on pins and needles. Jolly leaned back in his chair and lit up a bowl of fine pipe weed in anticipation. And so it was that Toby began his yarn. It all started last year when Myrtle was out gathering wild fruit for her pies. She knows the best places to pick the most delicious berries and the likes. Last year, she had set her mind on blueberries. Do you remember? Pies, muffins, tarts, and anything in between at the festival and Mid-Year's Day celebration. I can taste them still. A delight each and every creation, said Jolly, who had been lucky enough to sit as a judge at that particular baking contest. He smacked his lips and smiled. Well, Myrtle had been out picking late in the afternoon by the crossroads. That day, it was quite hot, and she called in at one of her friend's houses, and they, being good folks, kept her about for dinner. Of course, dinner led to dessert, and then to snacks, and then the folks just happened to have friends stop by for a bite or two, and they were all glad to see Myrtle, and so they stayed to hear her news and share their own. It was a merry gathering. But Myrtle could not stay all the night, and she did have to be heading back home with those precious blueberries. Can you imagine a baker of her stature not being ready for a competition? No, no, I can't, said Jolly with certainty. Nor could I. So it was that Myrtle headed home in the dark night with only the light of the full moon overhead to light the way like a lantern. When she had reached the Waymeet crossroads again, she heard someone whispering her name. She is a brave hobbit. So she boldly called out for whoever it was to step out and not be so mysterious and all. Imagine her fright when out stepped a, a dreadful bogey. 
And why, then, is her son-in-law the one with the white hair and not her? asked Jolly. Now don't get ahead of yourself in the quizzing, said Toby, as he patted his brother's arm. And you know she is made of stern stuff, our Myrtle, and she isn't the type to frighten easily. She immediately asked the bogey what he wanted. It was a small, dark creature with a huge nose, and she was not feeling threatened by it. The beastie said his brother had gotten his foot caught in a rabbit trap and had a terrible wound, and would Myrtle please help? You see, her reputation for good went so far that even the bogeys knew that she would help. Oh, indeed. I remember, said Jolly with a smile, the winter when she made little knitted socks for all of the cows to wear due to the frost on the ground. That is the, that is the kind of sweet hobbit that she is, said Toby. But she can look out for herself as well. So she asked the little bugger, and what will I get from this if I lend you a hand? The bogey scratched his little pointed head and said, for one, I will tell you which blueberry bushes we go we on and which we do not. <laughs> that way, you will definitely be ahead of your friends in the baking contest. Jolly stuck his tongue out in disgust. It was well known that bogies tinkled on the bushes despite the hobbits. So off to the bogey's secret home, Good Myrtle went. I will spare you the detailed description of that dreadful dwelling other than to say it was a pit in the ground with not so much as a stick of decent furniture. Bogies are not much for woodworking crafts, after all. But Myrtle was able to tend the smelly little fellow that had gotten himself caught in the trap. It wasn't too bad of a wound at all, and merely needed cleaning and a dressing to heal properly. Myrtle is a good one for helping the likes of them, said Jolly. Oh, yes, she is. That is why she ended up almost getting caught in a scheme the bogies hatched to keep her as their servant. They asked if she would not spare just a handful of the blueberries to make a nice sweet bread loaf for them. She could not say no, as they were going to show her the safe bushes after all, so she agreed. The bogies said so, as long as she was going to give them berries, would she be so kind as to bake the loaf? The nerve of them. Yes, indeed, but Myrtle agreed, and they showed her to the kitchen. What a mess the place was, but she set to work with a mix that they provided in a ceramic jar. One bogey asked her to use up what mix was left in the jar before she left them. Of course, the dirty little monsters had a magic jar, and it would not empty no matter how many blueberry loaves Myrtle baked for them. What a terrible trick! So it was. But the bogeys kept bringing her more and more blueberries once she had finished up all that she had collected herself earlier. She promptly put them into the doughy mix and put them into the oven. As each fresh loaf left the oven, the bogies would gobble it up faster than it could cool. Well, the old hobbit began laughing at their appreciation of her cooking skills as they grew fatter and fatter before her eyes. When she had finally had enough of their games, she threw the magical jar into the oven. Now, unless one of you is willing to jump in after it, I think we are done cooking for the evening, she said with great humor. The bogies all cheered for her and carried her on their shoulders out of their pit, and not only showed her the clean blueberry bushes, but picked all the best fruit off of them so that she would be fully prepared for the baking contest the next day. Jolly smiled broadly. I knew old Myrtle had to have help from magical hands to win all those contests, as she does year after year. But what of her son-in-law? What of Balbo and his white hair? Toby waved his hands in the air. I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Hey, maybe, but you are doing it in your own time, as it should be, grumbled the old brother. Myrtle was now the friend of the bogies. She visited them all the time. You know yourself that she is often out and about at odd hours of the night, right? It is so, said Jolly with a nod of realization. Well... Her daughter did not know what she was up to. She thought her mother had taken a liking to some old gaffer who she just might marry and thereby rob her of her inheritance. What a thing to think of her mother. No one liked Myrtle's daughter, Neville. Actually, everyone was surprised when Balbo Fairburn had married her. Rumors immediately spread that it was just to try to get at poor old Myrtle's money. Toby continued saying, Myrtle would go out on full moons to meet with her new friends, the bogies, 
and they would play cards all through the night. She won quite a bit of their gold from them. Bogies might be small and dirty, but they are also hoarders of wealth. If Myrtle lost, she would bake for them, and they were happier than if she had given them jewels or any other kind of material treasure. Of course, Nettle knew nothing of this. Fearing the loss of her inheritance, Nettle came up with her own scheme to scare her mother into staying home at night. Jolly shook his head disapprovingly. Nettle made little wooden slits, stilts, stilts for her husband Balbo to walk with and made him seem remarkably tall. She powdered his face with flour and made him uh, practice a ridiculously frightful laugh. She dressed him in a long bit of white cloth, then hid her husband behind a tree on the path to their home, all set to jump out and give her mother a fright, as if a barrel wife or some such creature had come for her. What could Jolly say to Toby about such a terrible scheme? Toby winked and leaned forward as he continued. The night was bright with a moon, and Ballow stood for hours waiting on Myrtle's return from one of her walks. He would peek out from his hiding place every now and then, hoping to see her. It was getting terribly late, and he was very cold, not to mention very hungry. The little stilts that he was standing on were digging into his feet, something ferociously, too. Just when he, he was about to pack it up and go home, he saw Myrtle coming along the dark of the night. But she was not alone. Was she accompanied by a stream of bogies? No, not at all. She was accompanied by a tall, dark man, twice the size of any hobbit. Toby stopped smiling at the story. Who was it? Jolly's face turned pale, and his eyes opened wide as he continued. Ballo had no idea who it might be with his mother-in-law. He gulped his breath and debated if he should still jump out and frighten the old hobbit or not. If he did not, then his wife would surely take the broom to him. So he waited. <laughs> the mysterious dark man and Myrtle were just on the other side of the tree and heading up the hill to her hobbit hole. Ballo prepared to let out a frightening groan to be followed by a shriek. Myrtle and the man passed the tree, and Ballow stumbled forward. Waving his hands in the air, he moaned and hooked his fingers into what he hoped looked like barrowy claws. That was when the dark man turned on Ballow. Eyes as red as fire burned in the man's face. There was a terrible hiss sound, as if a hundred cats were angry and ready to attack. Suddenly, Ballow realized he was not being looked at by a single pair of eyes, but by, by many small red eyes. Then the mysterious man blew apart into pieces. Each and every one of them leapt at Ballow. Jolly gasped and pushed back his chair. It was the bogies. They had climbed and clung together to take the shape of a man to walk Myrtle home. They wanted to keep their friends safe so late at night. On this night, keeping her safe meant attacking some hideous barrel white that had leapt out from, at them from behind the tree in the dark. So Ballow screamed at the top of his lungs and ran off down the hill, casting aside his disguise. Needless to say, Myrtle and the bogies had quite a laugh over the incident. Now, just you look the next time you see Ballow. He is wearing a hat pulled tight over his head. If the wind blows and knocks it free, you will see his hair, white as snow, just as I said. That is a great tale, brother, laughed Jolly. And all the better for being true, said Toby with joy. Just then, poor Bala walked down the path on his way into town. The two old hobbits nudged each other and laughed their heads off to see him. The young hobbit frowned at them and pulled the hat he wore tightly over his ears, grumbling all the way. Yay. Yay.